I'd like to introduce our next speaker. His name is Gabriel Paello. Gabriel is a precision technology specialist at, at VEDA, which is located right here in the Twin Cities. Gabriel's interests include precision ag, remote sensing, and nutrient management. He was awarded his PhD in 2021 under Dr. Fernandez as his advisor. And today, Gabriel will be talking about conducting research on your own farm. So let's go ahead and run it. He's doing it remotely. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Gabriel G. Espaillon. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about conducting uh, research on your own farm. So conducting on-farm trials. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I was not able to attend the, the conference uh, in person, but I'm still very happy to share some of my experiences uh, conducting uh, on-farm trials. So the agenda for today is I'm going to uh, introduce myself a little bit and the work that I have been doing. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about uh, why conducting on-farm trials. What are the benefits that we can gain that we can gain from uh, uh, implementing these studies? Uh, I'm going to talk about best practice uh, for delineating on-farm trials uh, on your own farm. So how to place the treatments in the in the fields, uh, how to block, and things like those. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the implementation of um, these trials. So things that. Uh, that we can do to make it easier uh, to collect the data and to uh, carry out the, the studies. Then I'm also going to talk about uh, how to analyze uh, the data from on-farm trials so that we can get uh, more robust uh, conclusions. Uh, and then in the end, I'm going to give uh, three examples about a uh, few trials that I have had a chance to, to conduct on my uh, current uh, position at VEDA. And then in the end, I'm, I'm gonna uh, summarize and give the, uh, the, the final take home uh, message as a, a summary or a conclusion of the, the talk. So just to give everyone a little bit of background about myself, uh, I studied at the University of Minnesota for both my master's and PhD with Dr. Fabian Fernandez. And for my master's, I investigated uh, the utility of uh, CANOP sensors for nutrient management at different development stages in Minnesota. And for my PhD, I looked at how soil drainage and tillage uh, practice, how they affect corn and soybean yield, and also nitrogen management, uh, especially for, for, for corn production. Uh, I took several courses in statistics during my degrees that have been very uh, helpful uh, on my current uh, uh, position. So right after uh, finishing my, my degrees, I started working at uh, Beta. And here also to uh, provide a little bit of uh, background. Uh, VEDA is a startup company that was uh, founded in 2020. And the main goal of VEDA is to increase the number of uh, acres that are cultivated under regenerative practices uh, in the US. So VEDA has these uh, farm hubs where we implement and experiment with uh, practices that are uh, considered uh, regenerative. And by that, I mean any practice that has the goal of increasing the resiliency of the farm, the profitability, soil health, and that type of thing. So my position at Beta is to take what has been published in the literature and then to implement it at the farms and also to evaluate it uh, at the farms. So I design a lot of uh, on-farm trials with uh, cover crops, so with termination dates, uh, seeding rates, uh, also seeding rates for cash crops, um, fertilizer application, uh, and that uh, type of thing. So one thing that is unique uh, about data is that it's uh, funded by two uh, large institutions, 
the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan and Coro, which is a incubator of companies uh, that provide resources to the company to do these uh, trials in the farm hubs, which would be very difficult for individual growers to, to do on, on their own. Uh, so now switching gears a little bit, I'm going to start talking about uh, the reasons why we conduct these uh, on-farm trials. So what we can gain from, from those. So on-farm trials allow us to see how the products or new equipment or management practices work on our own farm, on our own conditions, on our own uh, soil types. Uh, that also allows us to capture spatial variability in the response to inputs. And for example, sometimes we have areas that have um, that are under depression areas or lower uh, elevation. And then we see that there is a response in the way that uh, plants uh, behave in those areas. So trying to quantify those differences and optimize um, how we apply seeding rates, for example, or fertilizer. So should we apply different rates here versus here? So this is some. these are some of the benefits that we can gain out of uh, conducting these uh, on-farm trials. Uh, and it also allows us to uh, validate the, result, the results of uh, uh, small plot trials uh, within our own uh, farms. Another thing that I wanted to highlight is that uh, with the appearance of um, GPS technology and variable rate application systems, it has become much easier uh, to implement uh, these on-farm trials. Uh, and here, this this survey it shows that uh, for 2022, it shows that uh, for dealerships, it is very common to have uh, GPS guidance and auto steer in the, the machinery. And also we can see here that uh, the occurrence of variable rate uh, application technology for fertilizer application and uh, seeding rates and line is also very uh, high, uh, as well as uh, yield, uh, yield monitoring. So uh, these on-farm trials, they are going to become uh, more and more common as these technologies become even more uh, available. Uh, the main limitation right now, I believe, is more on the uh, analysis of the data uh, as compared to the actually um, implementing the, the trials in the, in the fields. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how to design uh, these on-farm on trials. So the first thing to uh, consider when designing a field trial is to elaborate a question uh, that can be tested uh, simply. So for example, uh, looking at just one or two uh, variables at the same time, for example, those early versus late or normal planting dates, how, how do they affect uh, yields? Um, or for example, looking at different varieties or hybrids. So how does my variety A compare to my variety B? How does uh, determination time uh, of cover crops, how it affects uh, my, my yields or my uh, cash crop, uh, the emergence of my cash crop uh, later on? So it's very important to keep it simple so that we are sure to be uh, evaluating or to be getting the, the response uh, out of those variables. When you start adding too many variables to the study, it becomes more difficult to distinguish uh, between the effects of one or the other uh, treatments. Uh, and it's also very important to always uh, include a control treatment so that, it, so that we can compare uh, uh, things too. For example, our control would be our uh, standard practice or planting dates, for example, or a hybrid that we usually plant on a, on a field, and now we want to compare to, to a different one. Uh, another thing is that uh, we need to do randomization and to replicate the, the, the treatments. 
So simply splitting a field in half and putting one treatment on one side of the field and another treatment on another side uh, is not very uh, helpful because those results, they may be affected by uh, soil conditions on one side of the field versus the other. So it's also, it's extremely important to replicate uh, the study uh, at least four times so that we can try to distinguish between what is the actual uh, treatment effects versus the influence of uh, um, the environment in the, in the results. Uh, and when possible, it's uh, advisable to block uh, the treatments by areas that have uh, more homogeneous conditions. For example, if we know of areas that have uh, higher elevation versus lower elevation, we want to block uh, by those conditions so that the influence of um, elevation is contained within uh, those blocking effects. Or also, for example, if we have areas that have uh, better soil fertility versus others that have uh, lower fertility, it's also important to account for those things. And the same thing with irrigation, uh, dividing uh, or applying a full set of treatments within, within each of those conditions is important to gain a real understanding of the treatment effects. So here we have an example of a design that is not well made. So we have uh, treatments one to four here, and they are all positioned uh, one beside the other. So there is no uh, randomization here within the four replicates. So treatment one, all the strips are together. The same thing for treatments two, three, and four. This is, so this is an example of uh, how not uh, to implement the on-farm trial. And what we want to do is uh, to randomize uh, our trials here. So here it's a completely randomized uh, design where we have the different treatments uh, placed uh, within uh, different strips of the, the fields uh, randomly. So we want to see, we want to do this uh, rather than, than this approach here. And here's an example of how to, to block. Uh, the, the, the trials. So, for example, we have higher elevation areas where it could be the first block, uh, second and third uh, uh, blocks on areas of uh, greater slope, and then on block four in the bottoms of the, the field. So, if there are differences in the response that are related to uh, elevation or slope, those will be contained within uh, blocks and they will. Uh, effect or those will be captured when we calculate the, the statistics. And here is another example about uh, different soil conditions and how to account for, for that. So for example, if we have a soil that is uh, sandier versus the other, it's good to also account for that and include a full set of treatments uh, within, um, within each of them. Another thing to consider is to uh, know the field history and to keep management practices uh, constant uh, across the different treatments. So, for example, we don't want to um, implement these trials in areas where we know that there is a lot of uh, variability in the soil or in the yields uh, in, in those areas. We want to avoid those areas. Uh, and for example, if we are trying different uh, hybrids or varieties, we want to make sure that we manage uh, the trial areas with, we, we use the same management practices across the trial areas. For example, we want to make sure that the different uh, strips, they receive the same amount of uh, nitrogen fertilizer, for example. And the idea behind this is to uh, eliminate or to minimize as much as possible the, the influence of parameters other than the actual treatments in the, in the yield measurements at the end of the, the growing season. Uh, and it may also be very uh, valuable to partner with uh, universities or other institutions uh, to conduct these trials. 
most of the land grant universities they have uh, on farm trial uh, research uh, or networks where growers can enroll and uh, implement uh, different uh, on farm trials in, in, on their farms. So there's a lot of benefits of, uh, of doing that uh, in the sense that you have your studies already delineated and uh, by the university uh, professionals and you can also help uh, account uh, use their help to, to analyze your, your results. So now I'm going to switch gears again and talk about uh, conducting or implementing these on-farm trials, things to, that we can do to make uh, it easier to conduct the, the trials. Uh, the first thing is to match uh, the equipment with, uh, so for example, uh, we have our planter that is a uh, 30 feet swaths and also have a, com a combined header with, uh, with a 30 foot uh, uh, head. Uh, similarly, uh, or at least have the, the, the equipment being at least a multiple of the combined header so that we are, so that when we are doing our harvest, it's easier to, uh, to get the data from the, the actual plots. So for example, if we have a spreader uh, calibrated to throw uh, the material at uh, nine feet swaths, so that it's uh, within a, a multiple of the combined header. And also it's important that uh, these strips, they have to have at least a, a, a dimension that allows us to be confident that the measurements collected from there are representative of the, uh, of the, the treatments. So as an example here, a strip file or a strip that is 30 feet wide by 900 feet uh, long. <clears throat> Uh, it can be very helpful to um, to use uh, traffic control by delineating the the path lines ahead of time, so that we always uh, come with the equipment at the same uh, tracks. Uh, and sometimes it may be difficult uh, to get the data if, for example, there's a mismatch between the size of the combine header and the size of the planter. So like it happened uh, this year in one of the farms. So the, the drill for rice was a 30 feet uh, width and the combined header was uh, 35 uh, feet. So we had to uh, combine at 30 feet swaths and lose a little bit of efficiency there just in the, in the area of the, the trials. But so this shows why it's important to try to make sure that the, uh, the equipments match in terms of um, you know, thick of their swaths or widths. Not always it's possible, but if it is possible to, it makes things much easier uh, for sure. Uh, and also to use uh, technology uh, as much as possible. Uh, nowadays, it's becoming more and more common that uh, growers have planters that are equipped with uh, variable rate systems and also uh, GPS uh, auto, auto steer. So these things help a lot to uh, keep a record of where, when, and how the treatments were, were applied. And for example, for trials with seeding rate, uh, it's pretty much a seamless process for the operator of the, the tractor, because you can just uh, upload the prescription with the, with the different rates within the, the strips and the, the planter or the drill does, does the, the changes in, in, in the rates uh, automatically. So technology helps a lot uh, in implementing uh, on-farm trials. Uh, one thing that I wanna, want to highlight is if we are, you are gonna use uh, yield monitors to collect the data, it's very important to do a pre-calibration of the yield monitor before harvesting the trial areas. Uh, and what I mean here is calibrating, making sure that the moisture sensor is calibrating, is calibrated. So getting a measurement and then checking it versus what the, the combined monitor is showing. And also 
collecting at least uh, three or four measurements with areas with uh, high uh, flow and low flow or high yield or low yield. You can also do those trends uh, with the speed of the, the, the combine uh, to simulate those conditions. But it's important to do more than two and at least uh, three or four, because as you can see here, the relationship between the mass flow, the mass flow sensor and the mass flow rate is not a linear relationship. So we cannot just take a couple of points uh, and consider the, the yield monitor to be calibrated. So it's necessary to do at least uh, three or three or four. Uh, another thing with uh, yield monitors is that the raw data usually has a lot of uh, errors. They are related to um, lag times. So between the time that the yield monitor actually starts recording the measurements versus the amount of uh, flow that there is in the in the sensor. So here in this example, we can see that uh, every time that the combine started uh, harvesting, the, the yields were low. But this is not actually what was happening in practice. This is just a defect or a bad offsetting in the in the in the lag time here. So it's important to um, inspect the yield data to clean it, remove uh, outliers, check for issues like this, and also issues on the size of the the header to make sure that the yield measurements there are actual representative of, of what happens in the growing season. So this is an example of what the uh, processed yield data looks like versus the raw uh, yield data. And if we wanna make uh, inferences about the spatial variation in the response to, to different uh, uh, treatments, using this type of data here will be very uh, misleading. So it's important to do uh, the calibration before starting to harvest and also to uh, clean and uh, inspect the, the raw data and process it so that you are confident that uh, you can use that uh, data. Uh, it's very common to use um, NDVI uh, maps for um, collected during the growing season to help with uh, processing the, the raw data here. And there's a lot of uh, satellite imagery that is uh, available uh, for free nowadays. So it's, it's something to, to also to, to consider when, when processing the, the yield data. But if you are not interested in seeing the spatial differences, um, in, within the field and are more interested in uh, overall how one variety compares to another, having just a green card with a calibrated scale or just uh, getting the uh, weights from the, the truck loads, that is already enough uh, to get a very good understanding of the, the, the treatment uh, responses. Another thing to keep in mind too is that it's important to uh, do scouting and to inspect the field to see during the growing season to see how the, the treatments are, are responding to try to identify areas where there may be confounding factors and in a way that you can uh, account for that at the end of the growing season when uh, analyzing your, your data. And Aerial imagery is extremely helpful for that. It helps to see, for example, if the differences are more related to, to the strips versus if there are any generalized uh, variability that is not necessarily related to the, the treatment. So uh, aerial imagery with, with drones or with uh, satellites is extremely helpful in, in, in determining those, those things. So now moving on to analyzing the results. So we designed our studies, we conducted them during the growing season, and now we are at the point where we need to analyze it and draw conclusions sort of thing. So things to do. If, uh, like I was mentioning, if data comes from yield monitors, make sure that we have processed the raw data 
and that uh, our data points actually represent uh, what was in the field. And then after we made sure that, all, that our data is good, we had to run a test statistic. So just comparing the mean of one treatment versus another uh, is not enough for us to be confident that there is act an actual difference because sometimes uh, small differences or even large differences may be related to um, uh, to field conditions in one area that uh, favored one treatment uh, versus the other. So it's important to run at least some simple statistical tests to to compare um, to compare the treatments. And there are some uh, tests, like uh, sim very simple tests to run, like the unfair GTP tests, uh, LSD tests, and and there's a lot of um, free um, free sources on the online that allow us to just uh, input our data, and it uh, provides the the results for for those uh, for those analyses. Uh, if we have more uh, elaborate uh, statistical designs, then it's necessary to have uh, some other more complex models. And then here comes the advantage of uh, being a part of a program with the university, so you can also uh, uh, get some help in, in analyzing that, that data. And here, just as an illustration uh, of a free uh, uh, resource to analyze your your fields of your the data from your own field trials so there are lots of uh, resources available and you can uh, see some of those uh, so now I'm going to talk about some examples of uh, on-farm trials that we conducted this year uh, and that's just to, to give uh, you an idea of what can be done the first study that I want to that I want to uh, share here is a observational study, meaning that uh, we don't, we didn't actually apply the the treatments uh, for this study here, but this also highlights that on farm trials they are not restricted uh, to studies where we actually uh, lay out the treatments. Uh, we can also run these observational studies and see how uh, the environment. Um, affected our 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 cash crops or our cover crops in this case here. So this image here it shows a field where we had uh, veg growing during the growing season, and we can see that there is a uh, difference here in the in the color. So these areas here in the center they look uh, more yellower. They look yellower compared to these ones here that are uh, darker green. So these are uh, depression areas that's where water tends to to accumulate more and the idea here was to uh, use uh, satellite imagery and to collect uh, biomass samples from different locations within the the field to see how much biomass and nutrient uptake there was in that uh, in that patch and then to get an estimate for the entire field of how much uh, veg there is or how much uh, nutrient uptake uh, we got during that uh, growing season. So here are the sampling points where we collected uh, veg uh, biomass uh, from on a one foot by one foot uh, squares. And here we targeted that areas with uh, contrasting or with different uh, NDVI measurements going from low to, to very high. And after we collected those measurements, we had them, them analyzed, and then we ran a correlation uh, analysis with uh, NDVI measurements on June 9 from, a, uh, from the Sentinel-2 satellite, which is uh, freely available, uh, to the different parameters that we uh, quantified on those samples. So we can see here that there's a high correlation for most of the nutrients, meaning that uh, satellite imagery, or in this case, NDVI measurements, uh, can get us a decent uh, idea of how much uh, nutrients and biomass there is uh, in, in that batch. 
And here, just as uh, just for reference, here's uh, how much uh, nutrients there was in the in, in those exact samples as an average. And then this allows us to uh, estimate uh, map genetic fake uh, throughout the fields, and also to get average values that we can use to um, to consider in our imagine or nitrogen management uh, in the in the growing season. So, for example, in this field, we had an average of 36 uh, pounds of nitrogen per acre uh, uptaken, and but there was a large range in the amount of uh, nitrogen uptake or nitrogen fixation, I should say, uh, by a batch. So this is an example of a observational study that is very easy to be implemented or relatively easy to be implemented. And that also provides uh, very interesting insights about uh, your fields and what affects uh, cover crop growth. So in this case was water accumulation uh, up here, uh, the main the main contributor, the main parameter that contributed to uh, the lower development of the batch uh, plants. So here's a, I have a, another example of a strip trial with biological products. So we had uh, four reps, and then we randomized uh, the treatments within those four uh, within those four reps. So this is a randomized complete block design. So four biological products uh, plus one control treatments. And the treatments were all applied as uh, inferral, not seed treatment, not, not seed treatments, but they were inferral applications actually. Uh, and this is a satellite um, in the VIE uh, map collected during the green season, showing the, the field where we applied the, the, the treatments. It was actually in this uh, western part of the field here. Uh, and then for this study here, we used uh, that simple statistical analysis by looking at the results from the from the different treatments within each rep and then we calculated a mean separation or a mean comparison test uh, similar to the LFT so in this case we use the 2k HSD uh, test and there were no differences uh, amongst the, the treatments. So no statistical differences amongst, amongst the, the treatments. And it's important to highlight, for example, if we had run just one rep by chance on this, uh, on rep one, we might have concluded that uh, treatment one underperformed compared to the other uh, treatments. So this highlights the importance of uh, repetition and blocking uh, as well. As you can see here that the block effect was uh, significant. So this is just an example of a very uh, easy to implement uh, on-farm trial. And now increasing a little bit the level of uh, complexity. Here we were looking at a seeding rate uh, trial so this is a field, and you can see here the pivot area. And then these uh, little polygons here, they indicate how much, so they have, they have an individual seeding rate for each of them. So we implemented these uh, strip trials with varying seeding rates across the entire fields. And the idea behind this study here is to determine uh, how does corn respond to seeding rates uh, within different areas of this field? For example, here we have an irrigated area. Do we need to increase our seeding rates here or not? Here is our <clears throat> dry land area. Do we need to decrease it? How does it respond? So we ran this study and collected uh, yield data at the end of the growing season. We uh, processed yield data and came up with a yield map that looks like this. So these areas of the field, they produced more compared to the uh, dry land areas in the, 
other parts of the, the pivot. So this analysis here is very interesting because it allows us to determine the influence of uh, seeding rate at different uh, parts of the field. So for example, seeding rate here uh, increased or decreased uh, the yields by close to 10 bushels per acre. So if we were to include to increase the seeding rate by 1,000 uh, plants compared to the average of the field, which was 33,000 plants, depending on where we are within the field, we may either increase our yield by 11 bushels per acre, or we may decrease our yield by nine bushels per acre. So this analysis here is very interesting to show us where we need to increase or decrease our seeding rates. Where, so how does the coefficient for the relationship between yield and seeding rate, how it varies uh, within the, the field. So this is a type of analysis that is a little bit more um, elaborate and having a uh, partnership or a collaboration with the university would be, uh, or other institution would be very uh, helpful to, to determine these things. But the idea here is, like I said, to try to optimize uh, seeding rates uh, within the field. So now as a summary and take home uh, messages. So for designing on-farm trials, so it's important to elaborate a question that can be tested simply. So either comparing one uh, control treatment uh, to another practice that you wanna see, or one or two more practice, not much more than that. Uh, randomization and replication are extremely essential. So simply splitting a field in half and applying one treatment in one half and the, another on the other half is not enough to draw uh, meaningful conclusions out of the effect of the, the treatments. <clears throat> it's important to know the field history and to keep management practice constant to minimize the effect of uh, confounding effects. Uh, partnering with universities or other institutions is extremely uh, beneficial. Uh, and also don't restrict your studies to causational experiments. Like I just uh, highlighted or I just showed the study about uh, VETCH biomass, which was a <clears throat> observational study where you can see the influence of your field conditions on uh, VETCH growth. And then in, for conducting the trials, matching equipment width, so planter size and combined header size is very helpful. Using technology, so variable rate systems, uh, GPS guidance, this uh, makes it easier, much easier to, to conduct these trials. Uh, doing scouting and keeping track of observations during the growing season is also <clears throat> essential, so we can see if the results are related to um, treatment effect or, or not. For analyzing this study, it's essential to run statistical analysis, and there are uh, open or free source or free resources that are available online that can be used uh, to, to run those, those trials. So just comparing averages is not enough. We need to make sure that the differences are related to the treatments themselves and not to anything uh, else related to spatial variability, for example. And also share your uh, results. Uh, so thank you all for listening to my uh, presentation. Uh, like I said, unfortunately, I was unable to participate uh, in person but I'll be more than happy to uh, answer any questions and you can uh, contact me via email or cell phone and I'll be more than happy to uh, talk more about uh, on-farm trials or anything that I presented uh, today. <clears throat>